and Vietnam veterans and the real life Army Indian. I'll do another couple just like Hood did. With me today is Major Rogers. He was also a great navigator. He flew with blood when he was employed by the Cody helicopter guys to be in fact. I'm also a member of the Southeast Texas Veterans Service Group. Our group is made up of veterans from all branches of service that are have served our country with honor and distinction. We are a nonprofit organization dedicated to honoring all our fallen heroes that have served and passed on before us. For 241 years, our nation has remained free and solvent, <coughs> a free and solvent nation. This is because over the years, our young men and women have stepped up at both in times of peace and as well as war to help protect the, our way of life and our freedom. The rendering of military honors is the only way that we as a nation have to thank the, the veteran and his family for the services that he gave him when he was on active duty in defense of our country. We're here to, and assembled here this afternoon to pay honor to one of these men. Captain George D. Byron entered into the service of the United States Army on 21 November 1969, after attending the Army Helicopter School at Fort Walters and Fort Rucker, he earned his rating as an Army Rotary Wing aviator. After graduation, he was deployed to South Vietnam, where he served seven months, 23 days as a combat <laughs> helicopter pilot. After returning to the United States, he was assigned at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, where he was released from active duty on 10 August 1973 with an honorable discharge among <coughs> discharge. Okay, as Paul Harvey said, now for the rest of the story. <laughs> Bud was a warrant officer pilot when he went the first time to Vietnam. He had two tours. And somewhere between the time he finished that second tour and before he went on his first first tour and the second tour, he received a direct commission to the rank of first lieutenant and then later became a captain. I did the same thing. Uh, I'm reading off of his last DD-214, which has the last part of his search career to survive. It was quite puzzling when I was going over it and after talking with the family, I, we've come to the conclusion of what the real story was. Okay, now, among his awards and decorations, he received the Air Medal with, Air Medal with First Oak Leaf Cluster and the B Device for Battle. He received the Air Medal with 32 Oak Leaf Clusters, which means he got 32, actually he had 33 Air Medals and one with the B Device on it, like I have on mine. The reason, this is the way the Army kept track of how many missions you flew. And rather than give you the whole bunch, they, put, they went to put numbers on the air medal to make it much simpler. He also received the Army Commendation Medal, the Vietnam Campaign Medal, Vietnam Service Medal with five stars, National Defense Medal, and his Army Aviator Badge, and Expert Rifleman's Badge, and three overseas bars. Also, he had, amongst this, he did win. Uh, listed, he received a good conduct medal because before the one flight school, he was enlisted. Our service here today will consist of my opening remarks followed by three volley rifle salute, followed by the playing of taps, and I will ask at that time that all that are able, please stand and place your right hand over your heart facing our flag to salute our flag and also the veteran that served so honorably under it. Okay, now, before we do that, I have something I want to share with you. And 
not what you were doing. Because this tells about what a Huey pilot's life was like in Vietnam. At dawn's early light, he casually walks to the slick, which is what we call the Huey slick, with his helmet in hand with, and with the dark visor down. His walk around complete, he steps to, from the skid toe into the cockpit. Switches and dials are, are all at his command. He may be tired from many runs, but it seems that he lives under a plexiglass dome. Top of the Huey had a green plexiglass pedal. But with a stick between his legs and the pedals under his feet and collected in hand, he once again feels at home. With the battery switch on and the start generator in start position and the throttle stop set, he fires the bit up the turbine as the pre-flight was completed. With the igniters popping and the smell of burning JP4 in the air and the Jesus nut, that's what we call the nut that holds the road blade on top of the transmission and the drive shaft. Mm -hmm. Because if the Jesus nut comes loose, you know where you were headed. <laughs> okay. The machine begins to rock now and starts with a steady walk, and the air begins to churn. With the instruments all in green to go, pulling pitch and half cycling his left pedal in, the massive blades begin to claw into the air. He skillfully lifts his baby off the ground. With the nose rising and the left rear skid off the ground, the tail begins to rise and the front seems to fall. But no better pilot will be found hovering from the rebutments on this day, as his day has become. I never knew his face. I never knew his name. But I will always never forget the day that the Huey pilot came. With the tower clear in this the surgical precision, he caused the Huey to hover, dip, dance into translational lift and climb it out to 1,500 feet. He sets his course, course to the first LZ. As he approaches, he descends down to treetop level and skims the tops of the trees. Low leveling and falling the nap of the earth, crew chief and door gunner are on the alert, covering his six, six feet in your tail. He listens to the Peter pilot and the crew chief and door gunner as well, as they guide him, guide the aircraft clear, and he watches for popping smoke. Tally ho, goofy great. <coughs> Through the chin bubble he, bubble, he looks down and at the relief, <coughs> don't get it here. At the haggard faces, they heard the walking of his blades and they know help has come. With bonus pinging, on the chin, thin metal and stars appearing on the windshield, radios blaring, the M60s chattering, people screaming, martyrs are dropping dangerously near, but he holds a firm grip, a grip on the controls and holds steady on the sight. Men clamber aboard with the wounded too. He saves dozens that day, and he takes supplies where nobody wished to fly. He would, for he returned through a hail of enemy fire. Carrying resupply and fresh troops in and body packs out again. We never knew his face, just his helmet and dark visor down, nor did we know his name, but we will never forget the day that the Huey pilot came. At base camp that evening, he helps the crew chief wash the blood from the cabin floor, and after fingering new bullet holes, he casually walks away. I never saw his face, I never knew his name. But I will never forget the day that you and Paul came. <laughs>